Four minutes are enough to win big with Mega Dollar. Just go to Lipana M Pesa, select pay bill, enter business number 29588, enter account name KBC. Deposit 10 shillings or more, enter your pin and press OK, then choose 10 numbers from 1 to 80 and send to 29588 and you can win up to 30 million shillings every 4 minutes. Deposit, play and win with Mega Dollar. Big game for big winners. This week on KBC Channel One. We are all misinterpreting the Bible. We have to look at the circumstance at which God said the words, Go forth and multiply and subdue the earth. It was only the Garden of Eden, Eve and Adam. Was there poverty? Was there unemployment? Was there the rate of starvation that we have today? You and I will never be at peace. And I won't ever accept any charity from you. It will not be charity. It'll be what's right. I don't believe you. Get a hold of Dr. Tapia. What happened? Tell him to come now. We're losing her. We're losing Andrea. Are you trying to kidnap me? No. No, I'm help! I'm being kidnapped! Help! 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 Uweza fanya nini kwa daka nne? Na mega dola! Unaweza pika shift? Na mega dola! Kila kitu ni mega! Uweza pika ugali? Na mega dola! Pesa hapa ni mega! Na mega dola! Labda uweza fuanguo? Na mega dola! Na mega dola! Ama unaweza tegeneza milioni palathini! Four minutes are enough to win big with Mega Dollar. Just go to Lipana M Pesa, select pay bill, enter business number 29588, enter account name KBC, deposit 10 shillings or more, enter your pin and press OK, then choose 10 numbers from 1 to 80 and send to 29588, and you can win up to 30 million shillings every four minutes. Deposit, play, and win with Mega Dollar. Big game for big winners. Good evening to you. You are just in time for Channel One News Hour on a day when Irid mothers took to the streets protesting what they say is the right for lactating mothers to breastfeed their babies. And they are pushing for the president to ascend to the breastfeeding mothers bill. And that will be forming the basis of our interactive segment. Uh, the protest prompted by events that took place last Tuesday where a mother was uh, denied the opportunity to breastfeed her baby in a restaurant and was instead told to use the washrooms. This parking condemnation across the board and of course sparking street protests today here in the capital Nairobi and that is what is forming the basis of our opinion poll question tonight where we are asking you should employers provide breastfeeding employees with lactating rooms should employers provide breastfeeding breastfeeding employees with lactating rooms the SMS line to engage us is 22162 let us know your thoughts uh, on Twitter you can talk to us at KBC channel 1 my Twitter handle at Kato Achinga should employers provide breastfeeding employees with lactating rooms? Keep them coming and that will be sampling your views later on in this broadcast. But for now, let's focus on the highlights. From any time between now 
and Friday. The way the uh, weather is, we will be expecting Masinga to spill. The rivers are full, the dams are full, and there is nothing we can do. Government issues a lot of a possible overflow of Masinga Dam, advising those living near the dam to relocate. Ghosts of the Mavoko Cemetery land scandal come back to haunt architects of the scheme. Kwa hivyo hii ni chakula ya mtoto na ni haki ya mtoto kunyonya. We are very sorry. Kwa hivyo hii management, atu kwa informed anything. And calls to have lactating rooms for working mothers intensify. Welcome back. You are watching Channel One News Hour with me, Catherine Achenga. Our sign language interpreter this evening is Steve Dunde. Today is Tuesday. That means later on we'll be having our interactive segment, Echo Watch. And today we will be focusing on the mining bill. What exactly is contained in this bill? Of course, coming at a time when just last week we saw at least six miners die in the mining field in Migori. And we will be looking at what are some of the issues to ensure their safety and what is contained in the law to ensure that the workers are working in different markets minds are secure and their health concerns are also taken into consideration. That will be a discussion that I will be having later on and I will be speaking to Benson Mocheng who is a legal expert and he will be putting into perspective what the law says and how can we best ensure its implementation. But for now let's focus on what's coming up in the news. Now we begin with the latest as regards the flooding situation in the country and the government has now issued an alert to all communities living along the banks of Tana River urging them to immediately relocate to safer grounds. Energy Cabinet Secretary Charles Keter says those living in Lamu and Garissa counties have until Friday to vacate with the Masinga Dam in full capacity and its waters expected to spill over within the next seven days. The warning comes six days after the Solai Patel Dam in Nakuru County busts are living in its wake a trail of destruction and death. Residents of Garissa and Lamo counties living along Tana River have only three days to evacuate from the area following a warning of possible water spillage at Masinga Dam that could cause displacement of people. Energy Cabinet Secretary Charles Keter says the dam is currently overflowing and might burst its banks. Masinga is the biggest dam. Already they have been and spilling in the other dams, uh, Kambere, Kitaro, down all the way. So for many time between now and Friday, the way the uh, weather is, we will be expecting Masinga to spill. Residents within the dam are being urged to move to safer and higher grounds by Friday, saying the water from the Seven Forks Dam is projected to move downwards towards Garsen. Within the next four days, after 18 when it's full, that water should be down to Carissa. Then thereafter, another about four days should be down to the coast region. This is a big challenge to us and also to the residents of those uh, living in Garissa, Hola, Bura, Garsen, downstream to the Indian Ocean. And amid questions over the short notice of just three days, the Energy Cabinet Secretary says there is little the government can do to mitigate the floods. However, the national government is currently working with county governments to ensure people are evacuated to safer grounds. Even the leadership, I mean, yes. we talked to the MP so that they also talk to those people. Uh, the, it's multi-agency. There are the organs which are in the, in the ground, mm -hmm. which will, of course, uh, take the responsibility in making sure that this is implemented. We'll be working with the Red Cross. In fact, our teams are already on the ground, and we'll be there to give them support and uh, relief for those who will be affected. On the flip side, Katara says the larger volumes of water could see the cost of power significantly drop. But even as the national government seeks to mitigate the effects of floods downstream, Senate Security Committee is now calling for the arrest of the Sulai Dam owner, Mansuk Patel, following the death of 46 people. The committee's report after touring the Sulai village for fact-finding mission on Monday questions the manner in which security agencies handled the situation. From reliable information, the, by Warma officials on the ground, only the collapsed dam was licensed out of the seven of the disaster. And even the collapsed uh, dam, although it was licensed, but it exceeded the recommended measurement 
uh, which was made by Warren. Led by committee chair Yusuf Haji, the committee members retaliated on the need for the government to move swiftly and resettle the victims. <laughs> schools within Solai are also yet to reopen following the tragedy. Majority of the schools saw a significant number of their population affected, with teachers and parents waiting to pay the last tribute on Wednesday during an interdenominational service for the victims. Brenda Zeda Radido, Channel Warren News. And now also at least six people have been hospitalized in two different hospitals within Kiambu County following a cholera outbreak in Gidurai, Kiamumbi and Riabai areas. Two people are receiving treatment at the Kiambu Level 5 Hospital while four are admitted at the Thickal Level 5 Hospital bringing to 36 the number of people reported to have contracted the deadly waterborne disease since Friday last week. Medics in Campbell County have been put on high alert following a cholera outbreak in the area. At least six people were admitted in two different hospitals within Campbell County Tuesday after they tested positive for the deadly waterborne disease. The cholera outbreak has been reported in Githurai, Kiamumbi, and nearby areas, bringing to 36 a number of people who have tested positive for the waterborne disease over the last five days. The patients were admitted after developing symptoms that presented a stomach ache, diarrhea and vomiting with preliminary reports by health officials in the county indicating that the victims could have taken contaminated water. Medics in the area suspect flooding could be a cause where raw sewage mixing with drinking water could have come into contact with food, especially uh, from people who are relying on shallow wells. County health officials are now advising locals to drink treated water and ensure they prepare foods under high levels of hygiene to avoid contamination. Leaders Marshagadi for Channel One News. And now former local government permanent secretary uh, Sami Kirui and former Nairobi town clerk John Gakuo have been handed a three-year jail term for abuse of office and breach of procurement laws. Anti-corruption chief magistrate Douglas Ogot convicted the two for failing to stop the irregular purchase of a cemetery land where the taxpayer lost 283 million Kenya shillings. Meanwhile, controversial preacher Gilbert Dare is finally out on bail after the High Court granted him a 10 million million shilling bond. Ben Chumba now reports. Former local government permanent secretary Sami Kirui and former Nairobi town clerk John Gakuo will spend three years in jail for their dubious roles over the 283 million shillings purchase of the Mavoko Cemetery land. In a landmark ruling, anti-corruption chief magistrate Douglas Ogot found them guilty for abuse of office and breach of procurement laws. Prosecution put its case against all of these persons beyond all reasonable doubt. And they are all found guilty and convicted under section 216 of this CPC laws of Kenya as follows. The court ruled that being persons in the authority, the two ignored their powers to stop the irregular punches and instead facilitated corrupt dealings. In addition, the court directed them to pay additional fine of one million shillings. Former Nairobi City Council Legal Affairs Director Mary Ngede and former city official Alexander Muse will also serve three years in jail and pay an additional fine of 52 million shillings and 32 million shillings respectively after they were found guilty of giving a misleading report claiming that the tender evaluation committee had agreed to buy the controversial 120-acre plot in Mavoko town. The controversial land in Mavoko, Machakos County, was intended to replace the already full Langata Cemetery only to be found that the rocky land was unsuitable for use as a burial site. Meanwhile, former government pathologist Moses Njue who is accused of stealing a heart from his patient has been charged before an Nairobi court. The pathologist, alongside his assistant who was not in court, are facing three counts including stealing a heart, illegal removal of the heart from a patient, and destroying evidence. According to the prosecution, Jue committed the offense on June 25, 2015 at Lee Funeral Home in Nairobi while performing a post-mortem on the body of Timothy Mwandi. He denied all the charges before Nairobi Chief Magistrate Francis and I and was released on a 1 million shillings bond with an alternative cash bail of 300,000 shillings. The case will be heard on July 2018. Finally, controversial preacher Gilbert Dare is finally out on bail 
after the High Court granted him a bond of 10 million shillings. Justice Luca Kimaru granted the bail following a successful bond reapplication by Dea, who is accused of stealing five underage children between 1999 and 2014 from a house in Mountain View Estate in Nairobi. Ben Chumba reporting for Scales of Justice. And elsewhere, the debate about the morality of nursing mothers breastfeeding in public took a twist after irate women took to the streets of Nairobi. The women marched in solidarity with a nursing mother who was allegedly humiliated for breastfeeding her infant at a city restaurant on Tuesday. Rose Gakuo has details of the drama and made calls for the president to ascend to the breastfeeding mother's bill 2017. Solidarity for mothers breastfeeding is a these were the scenes early Tuesday as the women converged at the Freedom Corner in Uhuru Park. This was a mission to defend what they say are the rights of infants to breastfeed. The campaign on the morality of breastfeeding in public revived by a recent incident in which two waitresses allegedly forced a mother to breastfeed her child in the washrooms, an act that has been roundly condemned. <laughs> is uh, violent towards women will face the full force of the law. Correct. Before, before you may not have seen government, but this time you will. And to drive their point home, the women, some of them clutching the babies, walked through the city streets to parliament buildings. <laughs> This was a campaign to have breastfeeding and changing facilities for infants demarcated in public spaces. Don't breastfeed in toilets because even you can't take your food to the toilet. And really, a crash is just a room and two sure, refrigerators sure. Yeah. and clean environment. Akina mama wapatiwe six months maternity leave. Kwa sababu, wakati wananyonyesha mtoto, wana contribute kwa ile inaitwa big four agenda ya universal health care wakati watoto wamenyonyeshwa vizuri hatutakuwa na shida watu kwenda hospitali miaka ya baadaye but they were not done with their mission the next stop the restaurant in which the nursing mother is said to have been humiliated where they demanded an apology at the same time we are very sorry Management, I don't quite inform anything. They petitioned President Uhuru Kenyatta to sign into law the breastfeeding mother's bill 2017. And as the scenes were unfolding in Nairobi, in Garissa, health providers were pushing for the arrest of those who humiliated the mother, saying it's the right of every child to breastfeed on demand. The hotel is not open for, for men only, because even women go there for their maybe breakfast, lunch and everything. So if, it, if they talk like that, it means that uh, no mother will go to a hotel because next time they know if they go to a hotel, they will be told to go and breastfeed in the toilet. They were speaking at the launch of Malezibora, week for pregnant and lactating mothers. The breastfeeding mother's bill is proposing any organization with more than 30 employees put up the mother baby friendly rooms with employers father obligated to give mothers with infants regular breaks lasting not more than 40 minutes every four hours. They say it's a journey that has been long overdue and as they march through the streets of Nairobi today, they hope finally the bill will be signed into law to enable a conducive environment for lactating mothers working in various professions. Rose Gakuo for Channel One News Hour. Well, those were the scenes in the capital Nairobi as mothers stood in, sol in solidarity rather uh, with the woman who was allegedly humiliated while breastfeeding a child at a restaurant here in Nairobi. And of course, that is forming the basis of our interactive segment. Uh, the women, they are also pushing for the implementation of the breastfeeding mothers a bill, which of course obligates employers to provide a room within which lactating mothers can be able uh, to breastfeed their babies or even... Um, 
express their milk. Uh, so tonight on our pinnacle question, we're asking you, should employers provide breastfeeding employees with lactating rooms? Should employers provide breastfeeding employees with lactation rooms? The question is right there on your screen. The SMS line to interact with us is 22162. Let me know who you are and where you're texting me from. You can also talk to us on Twitter at KBC Channel 1, my Twitter handle at Kato Achenga. Should employers provide breastfeeding employees with lactating rooms? That's the question tonight. Keep them coming and I will be sampling your views as we go along on Channel 1 News. But now let's shift focus to Somalia where Somalia is slowly regaining her foothold in the community of nations after decades of civil war pushed it to a failed state, presenting one of the biggest challenge yet for its neighbors. Kenya was among countries that sent its troops to Somalia as efforts to restore the Horn of Africa nation, which was struggling under the yoke of militants, attracted global attention. Channel One's Samson Kitabi spent some time with members of the Kenya Defense Forces in Somalia and chronicles the lives of the men in uniform. Morar Thank you In position Ready Fire Days and events blurring together as a result of the frequency of exchanges between them and those sympathetic to Al-Shabaab militants such has been a daily routine for Kenya Defense Forces soldiers ever since they were deployed in Somalia eight years ago in an effort to bring back sanity to a country that had degenerated into a failed state since the ouster of dictator Said Bare in 1991. <laughs> The Kenyan soldiers serve under the African mission in Somalia and the operations are based in Dobli and Afmado, the region near Kenya Somali border. Unfortunately, uh, the Al-Shabaab are the ones who are causing mayhem to women and children, uh, which is extremely disheartening. Resilient and determination can best describe the depth at which our gallant KDF soldiers have had to leave the comfort of their homes in pursuit of the enemy Al-Shabaab here in Somalia, so that you and I can have that peace back at home. With the ground operation proving tricky due to the continued use of improvised explosive devices by the enemy, the soldiers have resorted into the use of air surveillance and aerial attacks with commentable results. We are, we are trained. We are trained well. We have got maneuvers that we can carry out to maneuver such kind of weapons. But amid the raging battle, there is one soldier who is of utmost importance in all war zones. Meet Evans Wekesa, the chef at Tabda Base, which operates under the Dobli command. A trained cook, Wekesa explains how he has managed to maintain the morale of his fellow soldiers in a hostile environment. But with the security situation in the area proving unpredictable, you can never drop your guard. Samson Kitavi, Channel One News. Of course, Samson Kitavi, the reporting, he was in Somalia. A detailed report will be coming your way this weekend as regards what the Kenya Defense Forces are undertaking in Somalia as they try to ensure peace within the home 
of Africa. Now let's shift focus to Burundi where Eric Biagon is and the international community is calling for concerted efforts uh, to aid the deteriorating security situation in Burundi ahead of a referendum on Thursday, speaking at a state organized burial for 26 victims of terror attacks in Burundi Northern region, foreign envoys are regretted that the stability of the East African nation is constantly threatened by rebels from neighboring countries who intrude and carry out executions indiscriminately. We have our reporter Eric Biogon in Burundi and now brings us this report. <laughs> A somber mood engulfed Ruagarika village in Chibuchiko area of Burundi, bordering DR Congo and Rwanda, during the burial of the victims of a terror attack which took place a few days ago. The Burundian government officials and foreign envoys joined the mourners in condemnation of the May 11 killings. Especially if you remember in 2014, there came a group, a group of first, a first army group from Rwanda who attacked our community from Burkina Nyana. But uh, uh, fortunately, our army worked hard and they pushed them back to Rwanda. As a country, have condemned it in the strongest terms possible because we believe any Burundian who has grievances should not in any way use the blood of innocent Burundians in order to send a political message. They termed the attack an act only meant to destabilize the East African country. Our watu wakamatwe akisha wawashitaki kwenye madaraka akisha wende jela ama wawapike ingine fimbo murefu sana juu iyo vitu Hatuwezi kuwitika ata kidogo. Je crois que tout, I believe that all he means is being used to destabilize the situation in Burundi will not succeed. This is the final resting place of the 26 victims of the terrorist attack which shook the world. And now the international community is calling for concerted efforts to protect such incidences from happening. The attacks have been blamed on rebels operating from the neighboring countries. The cold blood executions took place just days before Thursday's referendum. Eric Biagon reporting from Bujumbura, Burundi. Eric Piagon there reporting from Burundi where of course they expected to undertake a referendum on Thursday where they will be voting as regards the presidential term limits and of course he will continue to keep us updated of what exactly is happening in Burundi. On that note it's time for Channel One News Hour to take a short break but before that a quick reminder of our opinion poll question stemming from events that have taken place here in Nairobi today. Women taken to the streets protesting an incident in which a woman was forced to breastfeed her child in the was washrooms. And that is what they're saying, that the government needs to ensure that the breastfeeding mother's bill is implemented, which essentially will compel employers uh, to demarcate a room for breastfeeding mothers to at least uh, breastfeed their babies. And that is what is forming the basis of our interactive segment tonight. We are asking you, should employers provide breastfeeding employees with lactation rooms? Should employers provide breastfeeding employees with lactation rooms? So keep them coming on the SMS line 22162. Don't forget to let me know who you are and where you're texting me from on Twitter at KBC Channel 1, my Twitter handle at Kato Achenga. We take a short break, but when we come back, we'll have our interactive segment. And today we will be focusing on the mining bill and how exactly will it be implemented to, sh to ensure the safety of workers as well as guarantee profits for the mine owners. That is a discussion that I will be having with Benson Ocheng, who is a legal expert. So stay tuned for that after this break. Every four minutes is a chance for you to win big with Mega Dollar. Just go to Lipa and Mpesa, enter pay bill number 295888, account name KBC, and amount from 10 shillings or more. Then select your 10 numbers from 1 to 80 and send to 29588. You can win up to 30 million shillings. Start playing now and win. Mega Dollar. Big winners every four minutes. We choose to go, go to explore the magical beauty around you, where no one thought we would go. We have gone for coursework, only to find more adventure, discovering something unfamiliar. 
which is quaking. When you step, it just, it's like a bouncing castle. At times, we look back just how we got here and where we might be going. And when we think our journey has reached an end, you will be surprised it is just the beginning. Magical Scenes with Irene Muchuma Odim Thursdays only on KBC Channel 1. Welcome back. It's time for Echo Watch, and tonight we focus on the mining act. Uh, of course, this is at a time when we have seen a very sad incident in which six miners uh, perished in Makalda mines in Migori County. Uh, of course, after the mine collapsed, and that's of course begs the question: just how safe are the mines, and what is it that we need to do more to ensure the safety of miners? And also, we will be focusing on the communities that live around some of these regions. Uh, mostly, you will agree that most of them do not benefit from the proceeds from the mine. Of course, the act seeking to address this, uh, but how? practical is this and are they getting the job opportunities that are envisaged in the Mining Act? To help us digest all this, we have with us in studio Benson Ocheng, who is a legal expert and he will be telling us uh, in terms of implementation what has been done and what more needs to be done to ensure uh, that both parties benefit from this particular resource that we have as a country. Thank you, Benson, for coming to our studios. Hello, it's my pleasure. Let's begin, you know, with a sad incident that we saw happening in Macalda mines. Right. It begs the question, just how safe are the mines? And, you know, when we talk about safe mines, is it really possible to have safe mines? Well, uh, to the second question, it's possible to have safe mines. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in this country, we've never had that uh, from time immemorial. Uh, because the nature of the kind of mining going on in Migori and Makalda mines is what we call artisanal mining. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you know, for a long time we didn't have legislation or a law that brought that into formal uh, sector of mining. And so it is artisanal in that it is done rudimentarily with the traditional facilities and in the traditional form. And uh, which means that you can't watch for the safety of the activities that take place in the mine. There is no expert to check whether the rocks and the ground is firm enough to withstand the pressures put on it. And of course, uh, we, they use rudimentary tools uh, which cannot really protect them. And they, they also don't use the right gear uh, that is required when they go into the mines. And uh, these are some of the key issues that we hope to resolve mm -hmm. with the Mining Act of 2016 uh, to bring all that into the formal uh, management system for mining in this country and uh, to be able to harness it and support that kind of uh, approach to mining. Is it captured in the Act and if indeed it is captured, what is the pace of implementation? Well, definitely, as indicated, uh, the main reason why we really needed mining legislation mm -hmm. was to bring that isu such issues into our formal system yes. of, of mining. Because prior to the 2016 Act, we had a colonial legislation actually dating back way back to 1940. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine that over 50 years after independence, we were still relying on that the same law. And uh, of course we know the idea behind colonial system of exploiting our resources was basically to take it away and let it benefit mm -hmm. other people and build their own countries. Uh, that was based on imperialism. And so it wasn't meant to benefit local people. And so it, the law did not capture the fact that actually there are communities that the live mine. near mines yes. and that were supposed to benefit from the resources. Yes. So the whole idea was to commercialize it, to exploit it for the big fish or the big men or whoever 
whatever one wants to call them. But it was definitely not meant for the local Mwananchi, what we call Wanjiku. Mm -hmm. so they were a forgotten lot, and so the Lord did not envisage them. And that is why, uh, come 2016, we felt that they should be part and parcel of the economic planning around mining. And so we enacted that legislation. And artisanal mining and small-scale mining are well provided for in that new legislation. But our communities are veering to this law because we are still seeing what we saw before even the act came into play. Well, the act still remains largely unimplemented, mm -hmm. uh, yes. as is the case with the complex or very comprehensive laws of this nature. They are implemented through regulations, mm -hmm. or we, as we say in law, the regulations are the hand handmaiden of the substance mm -hmm. of the law. So given that it was passed in 2016 to date, uh, we are still grappling with putting in place the required regulations which are supposed to ensure that the pro specific provisions of the Act are implemented. Mm -hmm. And just as an example, uh, the main issue we are talking about here is health and safety yes. of the mines. And uh, we are yet to actually even do draft of the regulations to deal with health and safety. Why is yeah. that? And it's you know two years on. If I could count 2016, 2017, and maybe well, 2020, one and a half years. To the credit of the institutions responsible, and that is the Ministry of Mining, I, the Act envisages uh, the need for about 20 or so different sets of regulations. Mm -hmm. And as we are talking now, 14 of them are in place. Okay. Uh, one may uh, raise an argument or question why we did not start with the most immediate ones, health and safety regulations. Yes. But uh, at least it's also good to recognize that the, 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 all these things are priorities, one time or another. Uh, they are as important as, one is as important as the other because some of the ones we have dealt with are dealing with the questions of licensing, mm -hmm. which is very important if we really want to invest mm -hmm. in the mining sector, and of course issues of uh, sharing, uh, benefit sharing. Mm -hmm. That is revenue uh, between the communities and, and, and the miners. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, of course the law I, under the constitution we envisaged and that uh, we would have legislation that defines benefit sharing arrangements uh, between communities county government and national government and uh, as you know that has not been done so the benefit sharing bill that one time came before the senate okay. has not been passed to date but generally under the mining act there is provision uh, for sharing of benefits, of course, it, now it, it is about ten percent. Uh, yes, it's, it's, so, it's, it's, it's <laughs> now well known that is in <laughs> is in the ratios of seventy, twenty, and ten, mm -hmm. where ten goes to community, uh, uh, twenty goes to the county government, and of course um, seventy percent to the national government. So, in your perception, is the ten percent you know sufficient for the community? Are they? benefiting adequately because that has always been a subject of contention that this resource is within a, is within our community we are the least beneficiaries we don't see you know development and ironically those who work in the mines remain the poorest well there's always a question of what is sufficient and uh, that one uh, uh, is difficult to answer that is important to observe or point out that actually the 2070 10 okay. was agreed and this is one of the legislation that went through a lot of public consultation as required under the constitution in article 10. Uh, one of the principles of governance in this country is public participation. The fact that that legislation went through that process and it was agreed that those are the ratios for dividing revenue that comes from mining I think is an important thing to take into account when we are talking of whether it is sufficient or not. As is the case with such legislation, uh, it goes through public consultation. Not everyone gets what they want, but at least if people agree on something, then it should be implemented. So the important questions we should be asking now is whether we have the right mechanism in place to ensure that communities get will the get the 10% mm -hmm. and that it will be used appropriately. So are and the regulations uh, for this in place? 
Well, not yet. We haven't defined fully how that 10% is going to be distributed. A lot of proposals have been made, but it's important to point out that we don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel because there are good examples of best practices the world, from elsewhere in the world where the communities have really benefited. And a case that I like pointing out is like in South Africa, there is this traditional community, the Bafokeng, which uh, in 2010, when we were watching the World Cup from South Africa, you know that one of the most modern stadia uh -huh. where the World Cup was actually being hosted was this stadium built by this traditional community. And they built it from resources, from mining of platinum, which were found in their backyard, at the Buffalo King Nation. So it is very possible that there could be mechanisms through which these communities could harness such resources. The An important you know mechanism. Such examples within the Kenyan framework. No, no, not exactly. We have, <laughs> haven't had experience with sharing benefits as defined in law, uh, and, and and we haven't had a very formal uh, organized system for sharing resources, but. Of course, one thing of a well-organized community, probably with a registered company, mm -hmm. uh, registered in trust or as a trust, and one that can be an investment vehicle for sharing of the resources that come from mining. I know that probably <laughs> sometimes you create a lot of problems if you don't define those well, because for a lot of people they might easily say, no, 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 just divide the, the money among us, and we know what happens in the localities where from when we see compensation is given say to an individual you many, on your immediate needs and not many times uh, yeah is on the immediate needs yeah. but we we've seen actually snippets of the kind of challenges we may have where there are mining or sharing of resources uh, I mean payment mm -hmm. uh, from resources that are accruing from natural resources that sometimes commun you just kill these communities because people get into lifestyles that they can't ill afford mm -hmm. and uh, basically overindulge in drinking and other kinds of, of, of things. So we have to be very careful to ensure that uh, we don't destroy local economies by giving these kind of windfalls some, some kind of because in mining we normally call it the Dutch disease which can easily occur when people think there is easy money that is coming you kill other uh, economic sectors because people then all focus on mining and we've seen this destroy many countries mm -hmm. uh, I mean in Nigeria mm -hmm. we know very well that this is a country that is very fertile and has got very rich soil with very good rain but part of the reason that the country can't always provide enough food, a lot of its food is important, is because uh, the oil sector took over everything and people, people sat on their laurels thinking that money will come. Those are the kind of things that we should avoid and this is the kind of debate that often arises when we are talking about capping the amount of money that is paid to local communities or to How counties and you know that this okay. is a very hot debate currently, particularly in terms of uh, sharing revenues from petroleum. Mm -hmm. All right, so even as you talk about that debate, the, the Act also talks about you know, employment opportunities for the locals. Right. And we've, we've seen incidences where locals have felt that they have been left out and, you know, foreigners brought in. But the bill talks about, you know, technical expertise being, you know, more uh, coming from outside. Is this right. being implemented? Are locals getting employment opportunities? Well, what we are talking about here is local content and is part of the wider debate of benefit sharing mm -hmm. because the truth of the matter is that mining, as the case with exploitation of any other, other natural resource, mm -hmm. disrupts local lives and social systems. Mm -hmm. So you have to find a way by which you compensate or at least uh, you don't disrupt the livelihoods of local communities and you do that by ensuring that they derive certain benefits in terms of employment, uh, this is what we call local content, mm -hmm. basically giving a degree of priority or uh, first opportunities to the people who bear the brunt of the particular activity that is taking place, that is mining. But also it's just in recognition that at least they retain a degree of first ownership mm -hmm. or first right to benefit from the resource. And but uh, is thirdly, happening at the local the, level? this is also important because incidentally, and particularly in this country, we've seen that um, the majority of areas where we are finding these resources have been marginalized and are fairly poor and vulnerable in a certain way. So this is also a way of ensuring that we boost them economically 
uh, in recognition of the fact that they probably need those resources to be able to catch up. But Benzo, as, these things are you know, very good in you, but right. practically, are they happening? That is the question. Well, we are in the nascent stages of developing this. Mm -hmm. I believe the fact that we have agreed that certain resources will go to this particular uh, designed framework mm -hmm. is important. Of course, you talk to communities, there is not a lot of confidence. This is partly yes. historical, mm -hmm. partly is just because of our political system. There is a lot of suspicion. And, uh, and uh, th that, is, that is probably one of the most tricky things to deal with in the current situation. Mm -hmm. Because uh, people just don't seem to trust that they will benefit from these resources. Uh, people don't believe that people mean well mm -hmm. for them. And therefore, uh, based on the historical facts that we have seen, okay. they, it is justifiable. The challenge that lies with the authorities is to find ways uh, to educate people uh -huh. and to build confidence. And you do this one step at a time. Okay, and okay. if we are not going to build that confidence, then it will be very difficult to deal with some of the challenges we are talking about. Okay, I'm informed our time is up, but in your opinion, right. do you think the mining activities in our country are well regulated? Well, we have a good law. Uh, to be honest, I think the Mining Act is, is as good as it could be. We need the regulations in place as soon as yesterday. And I think uh, two years down the line is a long time. Mm -hmm. It's good to appreciate that some efforts is going into this. But there is a lot of need to build confidence and, of course, to act in haste and speed mm -hmm. to put all these frameworks in place and, of course, to put in in place the institutions required to deal with these things. If we get that right, then I think we will be on the right path okay. to resolving this these issue. issues. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Benson. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but yeah. we do appreciate you giving us insights on what is contained in the Act and, uh, you know, just letting us know that perhaps it's the regulations that still need to fully be implemented for us to see change at, the, sure? at, the, level, at the local level. Right. Well, that is Benson Ocheng, a legal expert, just giving us insights into the Mining Act, of course, coming at a time when we've seen a very tragic incident in Migori County where at least six miners uh, died in the mines and of course just trying to focus on what are some of the best ways we can be able to ensure the health and safety of some of the miners. This is where we put our cap on Echo Watch but of course business news is up next so stay tuned. misinterpreting the Bible. We have to look at the circumstance at which God said the words, go forth and multiply and subdue the earth. It was only the garden of Eden, Eve and Adam. Was there poverty? Was there unemployment? Was there the rate of starvation that we have today? You and I will never be at peace. And I won't ever accept any charity from you. It will not be charity. It'll be what's right. I don't believe it. Get a hold of Dr. Tapia. What happened? Tell him to come now. We're losing her. We're losing Andrea. Are you trying to kidnap me? No. No, I'm, help! I'm being kidnapped! Help! 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 Good evening. Now we shift focus and speak matters business with me here 
uh, Regina Manyara. Now, Kenya Revenue Authority has destroyed over 560,000 uh, bottles uh, of seized illicit alcoholic drinks valued at over 200 million shillings. The destruction of the illicit brew is part of the nationwide crackdown being undertaken by KRA in collaboration with other government agencies, mainly targeting alcoholic products that have been imported illegally or manufactured locally without going through the due process. This were the scenes at the Nairobi water sewerage plant in Dandora. Officials from the Kenya Revenue Authority, NACADA, the anti-counterfeit agency, the Kenya Bureau of Standards were destroying illicit liquor seized by the multi-agencies. Kenya Revenue Authority has begun destroying over 560,000 liters of bottles of seized illicit liquor with an estimated value of 200 million shillings that have been imported illegally or manufactured locally without going through the due process. We have commenced a five-day destruction process that is running concurrently in Kisumu, Nairobi and Mombasa. So these are products that have been found to have been either manufactured or imported without following the right channels. We are talking about, for Nairobi only, we are talking about in excess of 550,000 products that we shall be destroying here. In Kisumu, KRA destroyed about 10,000 liters of seized illicit alcohol worth over 15 million shillings from various social joints, illegal distillers and importers. This is part of KRA efforts to eliminate illicit products that pose a health risk to consumers in the country. That working together with other government agencies, we can make our environment safe for ourselves to live in, we can make the environment competitive for those that are ready to work within the law. Take legitimate business in the way that we should be able to put a lot of effort to ensure that all counterfeits, whether on, each, on, on product of alcohol or even other product, we should be able to be there uh, to protect legitimate business. KRA urged Kenyans to be vigilant and alert security personnel of any suspicious activities. Caroline Jenga reporting for News Hour Business. Nata today launched a 7 billion shilling state of the art hot fuel juice line at the Nairobi Coca Cola plant, the latest and the fastest tech such technology in the region. President Kenyatta says the investment which will benefit over 30,000 local farmers during fruit harvest season and over 1,500 employees working at the plant complements Kenya's Big Four agenda. The new hot fill juice facility manufactures a range of products including fruit juices, sports drinks, dairy fusions and iced tea. It is the latest and fast such technology in the region that will benefit over 30,000 local farmers during fruit harvest season and over 1,500 employees working at the plant. President Uhuru Kenyatta said the recent need to commercialize the country's agriculture and raise its standards to both compete in the region and anywhere in the world. It is, I have said many times before, to commercialize our agriculture and to raise standards so that we can compete not just in our region but with anywhere, anyone anywhere in the world and as I am sure we will all expect that your plant will set and maintain these high standards and we also expect President Uhuru announced that the current concessionary freight rates being enjoyed by the business community using the SGR will be extended to the end of the year. We will extend the current concessionary rates from the 1st of July 2018 to the 31st of December 2018 <laughs> so that our businesses remain competitive. We are also in discussion with a view to cutting some of the taxes and levies on power bills or, and I don't want to raise your hopes, removing them altogether. 
Meaning of the cabinet met today and discussed several cabinet papers among them emerging the industrial and commercial development corporation idb capital limited and the tourism finance corporation to create the kenya development bank limited the cabinet approved expansion of kenya's diplomatic footprint by establishing seven resident missions six consulates general and liaison offices in various countries in africa and asia over the next three financial years Now, the Capital Markets Authority has approved the Nairobi Securities Exchange to roll out the derivatives market on a pilot phase within the next six months. NSC Chief Executive uh, Geoffrey Odundo says the pilot phase will focus on equity indexes and selected single stock derivatives geared at testing the functionality and the process of end-to-end -end transactions in, the li in a live environment. Cooperative Bank of Kenya and Stanbic Bank have been selected to act as clearing and settlement members during the pilot testing phase. Odundo says the pilot phase will inform decisions by stakeholders and regulators on the official rollout of the derivatives market. Now, Kenyans earning higher incomes are set to pay more if the t of taxes if the draft income bill tax or tax bill 2018 comes into force in its current form. This is after the National Treasury has proposed the introduction of another tax ban at the rate of 35% for those whose gross income is above 750,000 shillings per month. Those earning lower uh, salaries are for the third year in a row set to enjoy higher personal relief. As Nicholas Ndwati narrates, the National Treasury has proposed to increase capital gains tax from the current 5% to 20%. It will be a relief for Kenyans who earn lower income with the proposed adjustments, awarding them higher personal relief. According to the draft income tax bill 2018, that has increased the minimum tax ban from the current 104,000 shillings annually to 147,000 shillings annually. The National Treasury has proposed to add another tax ban targeted at high income earners, 3,000 shillings monthly, who would be charged income tax at the rate of that 5%. It is a blow for persons wishing to sell property with a capital gains tax which is charged on the net gains made from property by the transferrer or seller said to be increased 20% from the current 5%. At the same time, it's also a blow for PSV and cargo transporters with the rate of advanced tax for vans, pickups, trucks, prime movers, trailers, and lorries set to increase to 1,500 shillings per ton of load capacity, subject to a minimum of 2,400 shillings per year of income. For PSVs, the advanced tax rate for saloons, station wagons, minibuses, buses and coaches will be 60 shillings per passenger capacity per month, subject to a minimum of 2,000 shillings 400 per year of income. Moreover, the bill is proposing that a residential rental income tax shall be payable by any resident person for income received for the use or occupation of residential property. The tax, however, shall apply to income in excess of the lowest tax band, but does not exceed 10 million shillings during any year of income. With regards to individual tax relief, the amount of a resident individual tax relief shall be in the case of a personal relief of 16,806 shillings per annum and an insurance relief of 15% of the amount of premiums paid, but shall not exceed 60,000 shillings per annum. Nicholas Nduati, News of Our Business. Well, uh, we'll keep you posted about <laughs> what transpires come budget day, which is not so far away. Well, now my colleague, uh, Catherine Cheng is on the other side of the studio with what has been happening in the sporting arena. I'm Regina Manyara-Gitar. Do have yourself a pleasant evening ahead. <laughs>